talk from myself, Kevin O'Connell. I'm Chief Product Officer at Trust Payments. Uh, we're a UK-based acquirer with operations in Malta, all across Europe, and also North American presence out of Atlanta in the USA. Uh, as I said, I'm Chief Product Officer. Um, I've been in payments tech for about 30 years. My joke is I started when I was about 12, hence the fresh face, you know. Uh, I spent about um, eight years prior to Trust at MasterCard Labs, which is MasterCard's innovation and research and development division. Spent time with First Data running product in the acquiring space and then um, spent a number of years with Verifone, the pause vendor, running a Western European region of about 12 countries. So I've sort of been around the payment space for, uh, for quite a while. So looking forward to talking to you today on the topic of tap into the future. So it's kind of a blend of um, contactless NFC, a little bit of a journey on where we've come from and where we might be going around NFC, contactless, some of the new payment types or particularly a uh, rebirth of some payment types around QR codes that we've had post pandemic and during the pandemic, should I say, and a little look at some future and past tech as well in the industry we're, we're in today, uh, a bit of robotics, a bit of AI. So it's a short session, but hopefully you'll, uh, you'll find it interesting. If you keep questions till the end, we can have a dialogue and a debate towards the end of the session. All right, so let's crack on. So I think just to kick off, I think it's, it's, it's certainly not an overstatement to say that the digi digitization of payments has created for all of us a new set of you know, expectations from the retail or merchant or exp restaurant experience, okay? We're so used to having, and this will be a theme of this presentation, you'll see, you know, the always on connected supercomputer in our pocket that it's hard to get away from the fact that the consumer now, whether it's your first Uber ride or your first time you check in at a restaurant and check out and so on, it's just so easy. And the key thing for us as payment organizations is the payment is actually being pushed further and further to the background. You know, it's been essentially invisible or embedded into the experience. And that's actually a good thing from a consumer exp experience perspective, but it's a relevant thing to bear in mind as a payments organization, right? But from the restaurant perspective or the bar perspective, absolutely, the payments experience needs to be embedded. More importantly, it needs to be instantaneous, okay, and very intuitive, right? So. But it, always, it wasn't always like this though. If you cast your mind back 10, 12, 15 years, this was, and I see some you know, very young folks in the audience. So some of this will be educational actually, trust me, right? I'm gonna take a bit of a look back as well as a, a drive forward, all right? So just to start, I'm gonna play a short video here. Um, you won't hear the audio, but I'll talk through it as needed, right? So this is a company called Spice out of Boston. And again, I do uh, apologize if the video doesn't load, it won't be the, uh, the, uh, the undoing of me. This is basically about a, yeah, it's gonna be a bit patchy with the Wi-Fi. But essentially, this is a robotics play where a company called Spice out of Boston have opened up a restaurant, three MIT grads. And what they're using is they're using a robotics-based technology to actually do the salad making. You know, so it's a salad, salad play, a health, health, health play. And you'll see in a moment, they went to, the, sorry, they went to this, um, these are the grads, right, in question. They went to this uh, Michelin, Michelin starred uh, restaurant dude out of Boston, hooked him into the, the, uh, the enterprise. And these, this is basically what's making your food in the back kitchen, right? It's these automated devices. There's about 20, 25 of them in each restaurant. What it's doing is it gets the ingredients, which is loaded up manually, and then it basically does the, the manipulation and the manufacturing of the actual dish itself, right? Uh, in, in an automated way. So yeah, it's a bit of a fad, it's, but it's an interesting look at the, the back of the kitchen in terms of what the tech here in this case, AI, robotics, and so on, uh, is actually doing. These guys are highly excited about it, as you can see, and we'll see where it all goes, right? Uh, right, let's move on. Very. But as I said, it wasn't always like that. It wasn't always automated. It, was, it wasn't always fully mobile. We weren't always living in a connected world, if you cast your mind a little bit back. Those of you of a certain age will remember when you were in a restaurant in a dining environment, you used to have this type of experience, right? So essentially for those who are, don't know what the hell this is, and I look at a few of my own colleagues, uh, Luke and our team, um, when you were dining guys, Manny, not too, not too long ago now, we're talking 2000 or so, right? Uh, you sat in, your, in, the, in the dining experience, you had your meal, you consumed your food and beverage, as they say in the US, then you asked for the bill. The bill came to you. If you're paying cash, great. You put your, your cash into that wallet and they went off and got you change, right? However, if you were paying by card, and this wasn't the NFC world, this wasn't the mobile Google Pay, Apple Pay vintage world, right? This was a piece of plastic, right? You um, used to deposit your card in that wallet and they would go off to the back office somewhere, generally swipe the card through a payment device and come back to you with something that looked like this, which is basically a credit card receipt. 
uh, on here you would sign because that was the form of authentication we had back then, right? Seems archaic now, right? A bit like CDs, right? And um, more importantly, you could also put in the tip. So the tip amount would go in here as well. It had a few essential flaws, though, when you look at the workflow. One is uh, there was only one pause device generally at the countertop in the back of the uh, restaurant. And two, and more importantly, and I see our chief risk officer, Tom Pilling here sitting in the front row, um, it, there was an awful amount of what we call skimming in the industry going on, whereby the card left your site, went somewhere you didn't know where it was. It could, and in many cases, in a tiny fraction of cases was scammed, as in it was scammed and in, skimmed into a skimming device, which essentially stored the track two, track three data. Uh, and in essence, a white a clone of your card could, I don't say it always happened, it was very a modest percentage, a white, a white, white plastic clone of your card could be in circulation by close of play that day, if that makes sense, right? Going to ATMs or whatever it was. So it was insecure and it was also not a very uh, efficient operation for the restaurant, okay? So then we fast forward to about 2004 vintage. Um, I mentioned I worked for Verifone in the, well, I worked in the early 2000s till about 03 to about 09. So, but first of all, in Genico, uh, the, the pause industry back then was a bit of a duopoly, right? Nowadays, you're probably used, if you're in the industry, to dealing with tens, if not many tens of uh, vendors, right? There's a, a, a huge amount of pause vendors in the industry today. Back then, it wasn't quite so simple. There was about three to five. The top two were probably Verifone and Ingenico. Ingenico, French, French headquartered. Verifone, still right around today, both of them. Verifone, uh, based out of California. And it was Ingenico who came to the, came to the, uh, came to the, um, the market first with the device you see on the left there, which is basically quite a chunky device, but it was battery based and it had GPRS on there, right? So essentially it was a countertop pause terminal that had been rather crudely fitted with a battery, okay? This would then be uh, brought to the table and the beauty of this was the consumer could insert their card if it was chip, swipe their card if it was signature, and the card never left your site. Okay, so it was a very, very early version of, if you look at what Ingenico trademarked at the time, uh, pay a table, pay ampersand table, right? What was quite funny, just as a side note, and I'm sure the uh, Efficient Secrets Act has written this now so I can tell you, right, is that Verifone, my own, my own company I worked for, we also started producing collateral which had pay a table on there, as in pay at table. And then Genico served us with some legal paperwork to desist from doing that because they had got there first, right? Essentially, both devices did the same thing. You'll notice the Verifone had a really ungainly antenna as well on the back there, right, to make it actually work. And what you'll see here is these were essentially countertop devices that in very quick time, probably three months, six months tops, had been fitted with onboard batteries and GPRS radios to make the thing work, all right? But this was the advent of, if you will, that, that we now take for granted uh, if we're not doing a digital checkout, somebody coming to your table with a pause device, okay? So around 2004 or so. Now, I didn't say at the outset of my talk, let's make, make sure I'm okay on time, that I was gonna involve some spacecraft in this, some spaceships, and trust me, this is the first time because when I got this title from my colleagues in trust, I said, how can I make this a bit interesting? Because let's face it, contactless payments, they kind of do what they say on the tin, right? So I said, how can I make this a bit interesting? I had some prior material, and long story short, and now for the very, very first time in my speaking career, I've got a, a spacecraft on a slide about a payment, right? So that's an achievement in itself, right? So what is this? This is the Apollo, famous Apollo 11 spacecraft. Again, I wasn't born for this, just in case my colleagues think I was, right? I'm, just about by a year or so, okay, here. So 1969, man lands on the moon, tremendous achievement, right? Uh, however, 1969 and rocket science and rocket ships wasn't the only thing uh, going on. So a gentleman called Helmut Gottrup, okay, who in 1969, he was actually a, a rocket engineer originally for the Germans and then later for the Russians. So worked on rocket technology and so on. I'm not sure if he was fully involved in the Russian space program, but he was certainly involved in rocket technology. Right? So he also had an interesting sideline, um, uh, which he started to work on, let me just bear with, on this, okay, in 69 with a colleague of his. And this is the world's first integrated chip card where the, the processor is actually embedded onto a, an actual card, as you can see here. So they started on this around 69 or so, the same year as man to the moon, right? And then it evolved into this very more, slightly more familiar looking piece of tech, which you'll notice is actually IC card that's on all of your chip cards in your pockets today. So this is a circuit 2007 vintage um, chip and pin card. It's an x-ray, right? You can just about see the uh, integrated chip in the center. It's two square millimeters. And uh, as I say, these started rolling out, rolling out around 2007. 
Just to come back to the space program, however, really, really quickly, uh, this was the, uh, the user interface for the astronauts at the time. Again, this is two space slides, so I'm kind of, if you can't tell, I'm elated here, right? I'm talking about space stuff, yeah? I can bring this home to my kids and tell them I work in NASA, yeah? Uh, so, so this is actually the user interface. Basically, the com computation power of what got man to the moon in 69 was very, very limited. This was actually part of the processing environment for that very small, very rudimentary, uh, almost calculator type computer. So I'll come back to this in a moment, right? Um, so essentially, these guys, they patented this technology around 79. And the patent obviously has run out by now with these two gentlemen patented the chip card, which is now part of our you know, everyday uh, payments experience when we're using a piece of plastic with NFC on there, right? Now, back to, and I know this is actually a very uh, strange coincidence. My colleague Tom, who talked about risk earlier and dispute management, also used this slide, but we actually came to it independently because I swear did we, not see, we did not see each other's slides, right? In advance. But this is essentially what a card looked like circa 1957, as you can see. The world's first card was actually a diner's card, diner's club, right? Came into existence. I, I wasn't born for this either. I hastened to add, right? Piece of cardboard. So you could say that the very first, most biodegradable and green and eco friendly cards of all compared to the plastic monstrosities we carry around, they are changing for issuers with MasterCard, right? So first card arrived in about 1950. It was actually a charge card rather than a credit card. So you, you paid off the, uh, the balance every month. But this is what the merchant used to identify you when they made the telephone call to check you had the funds if they made a call, right? Um, but another very important event happened in our world today as we know it for payments, be it hospitality, retail or whatever. And that was in 2007, right? I mentioned the NFC uh, chip card in 2007. And that was the invention of the um, wonderful Steve Jobs launching uh, company Apple launching the iPhone. We all know there's been many, many iterations since then. My first iPhone back in the day was actually a 3G device, which I cherished and loved because I am and will always be an Apple. I wasn't uh, a good Android guy, right? But roughly the same time, Google acquired the Android OS and the rest is history for Google as well. Um, what's interesting here is, the processing power of an iPhone um, of an iPhone uh, 6, right, which came out circa, I guess, 2010 or so, 2011. The processing power of an, uh, an iPhone 6 is actually 120 million more powerful than the computational power that got man to the moon in 69, hence me showing you that little keypad. So between that keypad in the actual uh, launch module and the, uh, you know, the, the guys back in the US controlling over a very um, low density radio wave from uh, somewhere in, uh, in Florida, um, the computational power of the iPhone 6 is 120 million times, which is phenomenal, right? So we got to the moon in 69 with a piece of rudimentary tech, and here we are, um, you know, a number of years later, we're all carrying around connected devices, number one, that, that could land actually 120 million spacecraft on the moon in parallel. So, you know, what we're saying there is the op opportunity is endless with these devices, yeah, and with these uh, interfaces. It's really for us to go and build stuff that compels consumers and actually uh, solves business pain points, right? Just not to labor on this one, another one I really like in terms of a bit of a computer science nerd, as you can tell, is um, that Apollo guidance computer from 69, right? If you went and found uh, two NES systems, the very, very original NES, I unfortunately never had one of these as a kid, didn't get into gaming until years later, but around 1984, 85, Nintendo launched the NES system. Uh, two of those actually in 84 had the same power as the Apple guidance computer. And then if we fast forward, any one of you who studied computing science back in the day will have heard of Cray, the Cray supercomputer. Don't think they exist any longer. They, they were a thing back in the 90s, 80s for pure computational power. Um, turns out the iPhone 4, you know, which is a very early uh, product in Apple's cycle was actually uh, the same power as one of those supercomputers. So what we're saying here again is the computational power, Moore's law is alive and well. Moore's law is this computational algorithm that says uh, a gentleman who worked for Intel in the 50s and whatever, that computational power will double about every 18 months. He made that prediction around 55, 60, and it's actually stood true to this day. We're going to run out of um, the physics laws of physics will eventually mean it can't happen any longer because the chips won't be able to get any smaller and so on and any more precise. But essentially right now to this day, it's still the case that the computational power, uh, you know, keeps on rising, right? When you add that power, right, what we have in terms of at our disposal as providers of technology and solutions to the industry, and you couple in 4G or even better 5G tech, 5G comms, 
you know, you really do have a phenomenal, um, as I say, tool at our disposal to, so shame on us if we can't deliver great experiences, right? And ultimately it's culminated in this, for, to bring it together from a payments, from a payments and payments tech perspective, it's culminated in this, right? Now, when I was in MasterCard Labs, we always used to say that digital wallets wouldn't really be there until we leave our, our digital payments. Wouldn't be there until we left, could leave home with two things, our smartphone and our car keys, right? If we weren't on public transport, yeah? And uh, it turns out now, if you want to go on public transport, you can actually leave home with one thing. You don't need your plastic, your card. You leave home, obviously, with your device. And the NFC technology built into both the Apple and Google stacks will take care of that payment piece for you, which is pretty cool, yeah? The other big thing, of course, that happened relatively recently is the increase in the limit to make the utility of this much better. So the £100 limit here in the UK, comparable in most of Europe. As it happens, um, both um, Canada and Australia for many, many years have had limits on NFC, plastic or mobile digital, for about 100 bucks. So it's taken Europe quite a while to catch up and actually raise that limit and drive the utility of contactless payments, you know, that little bit more useful than just a limit of 30 pounds or whatever, yeah? But uh, this is where we're at now, obviously. This is what we've culminated in. And, uh, you know, as you know, the form factors now are far more elegant than those 2004 vintage POS devices that I showed you, the, the countertop devices with the batteries in there, right? So we have very slick uh, smart POS type devices. We have different form factors for our, uh, for our physical cards to be stored in. We have a variety of companies operating in the, in the wearable space. Again, as an Apple fanboy, I'm naturally wearing an Apple Watch, right? So these, these brands will mostly be familiar to, to you all, yeah? And uh, ultimately, it's a very, very, um, very, very complex and a very, very um, flexible environment we now have in terms of the payments infrastructure that's out there, right? POS devices, NFC, fast, fast devices, and then a variety of different form factors. So we really, as they say, have never had it as good, right? From a baseline NFC payment perspective, right? Now, it would be remiss of me to talk about tapping into the future without talking about this, the humble QR code, right? Because there was a time when the QR code was considered like an also ran. It was basically dead and, dead and gone back in the early 2000s. It was in use in Asia, Japan in particular, China and so on for various use cases. But it really wasn't picked up by, uh, should we say, um, Silicon Valley tech, you know, at that point in time in any shape or form, right? Fast forward, uh, so just, just a bit of background for the uninitiated. Again, I wasn't, was I around? I was around when this was, uh, and it was created in 94, 1994 as a piece of tech by a Japanese uh, car manufacturing component company called Denso Wave. And what was used, it was a sticker that used to go on components for the cars on the production line to basically help them organize the overall build of the, the vehicles and so on, right? That was its original intention, right? Uh, obviously, nowadays, they often contain shortcuts to either a locator, identifier, or a tracker uh, when you scan one with your smartphone camera, which brings you to an application or to a website, right? Very handy, as we know, for the COVID environment we live in today. Um, and as I say, the advent of that, where you didn't have to go to a website, but you could also uh, auto start an app, which came into the OSs of both Apple and Android in recent times, has been pretty cool for that, where you can go straight into an application experience when you scan the QR code. Uh, I won't go into this in detail, but as you can see, there are there is method method to the what looks like a random number of dots pixels the real method to it there's a you know there's four required patterns there's a position an alignment phase timing phase and then a, i love the term the so the quiet zone yeah so that's the uh, the qr code now as i say the now ubiquitous qr code really came into its own through covid right you could argue it probably got a rebirth of sorts it was in use but it wasn't in use at anything like the levels we see today right i mean i don't know about you guys but if you've been to a dining environment during lockdown for takeaway for dine-in um, chances are you use this at some point in time. And it wasn't just for the payment, right? It was for the menu. It was for the, uh, you know, the, the digital menu, menus alone dramatically reduce waste in the industry, you know, having to print those every day, not having to get someone to stuff the menus into the, into the menu books every day, huge. Menu availability can be updated in real time. So if something goes out of stock, you just take it off the menu. Um, uh, you know, health, health and uh, dietary requirements and so on and so forth, really, really good. So allergies and so on, right? So, you know, the QR menus are obviously more hygienic as well in terms of you're not touching something from a pandemic perspective. So they've really come into their own. And uh, I think our view in Trust Payments is the investment by a restaurant environment to, to license this type of tech from a vendor or partner, um, you know, it'll be, it'll be pay, payback for years to come. These are not going to be for us now for at least three to five years, I would think, right? And then another side note is we talked about it a little bit earlier. I know it was 
and entertain you guys a bit about the, the computational power. Um, you know, the, the, the best experts out there around digitization in general, you know, the adoption of new form factors on things like this, uh, would say that the pandemic actually probably brought us forward somewhere between three and five years of digitization. So it would have happened naturally, stuff we see today, but it got that shot on the arm, no pun intended, from COVID, right, to, to, to drive and, and drive these contactless type experiences uh, for, for, for public health reasons, right? Many of you will probably be aware of McDonald's did an interesting investment over the last few years in a particular company. Uh, his name escapes me now, but a particular company that actually had a predictive AI-based personalization system. So they've now deployed that at their drive-thru environments, right? So the idea being when you drive to a drive-thru in McDonald's, may not be rolled out globally, but it's basically in the works, right? What it's doing is it's using other, other, other info like weather, the time of day, other trends, what's happening in the world, etc., traffic around the area and so on to personalize your menu, right? So, you know, if it's summer and it's a nice summer's day, you might get offered the ice creams as the extra, the sundaes and so on and so forth. Um, again, um, really, really, really interesting in terms of how it might drive, you know, that predictive type um, add-ons. So it's not really about saying you don't want a Big Mac today. Maybe you probably want a Big Mac. It's more about the upsell of the ancillary items, right, from a, an overall basket perspective, right? So really, really interesting tech, yeah? Uh, one other short video. Again, there's no audio on this one, but I was fortunate enough, in, again, to be uh, over in uh, UC in Berkeley uh, in California not so long ago. And there's a company over there, um, KiwiBot, and this is some of the KiwiBot uh, robots running actually in Denver. In this situation, it's from campus. It's a robotic-based device, as you can see. The food goes in when you order from the app. It could be any restaurant. And then the bot will make its way to the, to the actual destination, right? So in this case, it's making its way around the University of Denver. But if you're in the Berkeley campus in California at the moment and you're walking around, you see these things all over the place. And they do actually coexist rather well with the, um, with the human footfall, you know. In there, you have all the same stuff that the self-driving cars have today. So you got the detection of humans, detection of traffic lights, detection of crossings and all that kind of stuff. Fascinating to walk behind one for, for even a couple of minutes, right? So with that, I'm gonna wrap now, okay? So just to finish, uh, this is courtesy of um, CB Insights, as you can see. And obviously, just, just I've only scratched the surface there, right? This is just an example of how, t how busy the restaurant tech space is. You know, everything from, you know, energy efficiency to loyalty and rewards. We have a great loyalty stack and trust payments. So loyalty, we feel, is obviously a key part of this industry, right? But, you know, smart kitchens, tabletop devices, uh, you know, um, food waste management, reservation platforms like Open Table and so on. Very, very busy um, environment. And it's fascinating, again, when we talk about tech, you know, in the space race in 69, how all the technology that's on here Thanks to cloud, AI, you know, smart devices like these, as I said, it's really all made possible, you know, which is, which is phenomenal stuff. So this very, very busy space, really, really, really interesting to see where things uh, go in years to come. And with that, I'm going to wrap just to uh, call out who we are. So we're Trust Payments. We're based here in the UK. We have businesses in across, business across Europe out of our Malta location. Uh, here to help for anybody around, uh, not so much robots. Not there with the robots yet. You can talk to my colleague Eric about the robot tech. Yeah, I'm just just getting Eric. Uh, you know, a great payments partner for anybody in the hospitality or restaurant space who wants to work on payments. We can figure out the rest. I'm sure. Thank you very much.